Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Bernard, and I'm here with Ben Rhodes, Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications at the White House. A few minutes ago, President Obama addressed the nation from the Oval Office regarding the end of US combat operations in Iraq. And all day, we've been collecting questions from the public about Iraq. So thousands of people have contributed questions and voted up their favorites on YouTube. You can actually go to YouTube right now and see the questions that have been submitted, even vote up ones that you, want, you think should be more popular. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so answering as many as we can from the list that you, the public, have decided were the most interesting and most important about Iraq. So why don't we jump into it? Great. So Ben, first question uh, is coming from Ted the Librarian in Chicago, Illinois. Are there still US military bases in Iraq? If so, how long will US troops still be in Iraq? And when will all of the troops leave? Great. Well, thanks, uh, everybody, for submitting questions, first of all. And uh, thanks, Sarah, for hosting this. Um, it's a great question, Ted. Um, just to put things in perspective, uh, when this administration took office, there were nearly 150,000 US troops in Iraq. Uh, as part of the responsible drawdown that the president announced in February 2009, we have since removed nearly 100,000 US troops from Iraq over the course of the last 18 months. So this has been an extraordinary uh, redeployment of our uh, military men and women out of Iraq over the course of the last 18 months that has gotten that number down from about 150 to under 50,000 US troops who are in Iraq today. Uh, you mentioned bases. We've also transferred hundreds of bases. We had basically set up bases around the country. We've closed or transferred hundreds of those bases to the Iraqis. What remains in Iraq today uh, is uh, roughly or under 50,000 US troops. Now, the mission, as the President said tonight, has changed. Uh, in the past, the United States had responsibility for security in Iraq. What we've done over time is gradually transition that to an Iraqi lead. And today, what we've done is formally end the United States combat mission in Iraq. Now, the Iraqi security forces have lead responsibility for securing their country going forward. The troops that remain today uh, are going to perform some distinct functions over the next several months. First of all, they're going to continue to advise and assist Iraqi security forces. We've trained the Iraqi security forces and equipped them. And that training, that advising is going to continue, even as Iraqi security forces are the ones that have responsibility for securing the country. There's also going to be the ability of our forces to support Iraqis as they carry out counterterrorism missions. And this is important. The Iraqis will be in the lead. Uh, we've seen, for instance, in recent months, um, targeted counterterrorism operations that take out leaders of Al Qaeda in Iraq which is the main terrorist organization that, that continues to try to set off bombs. The Iraqis will be in the lead in those operations, but we'll have the capability of supporting them uh, with our forces that are there. However, over the course of the next year and a half, uh, we will all continue to move our troops out of Iraq. We have an agreement with the Iraqi government that was reached in 2008 to remove all US troops from Iraq by the end of 2011, by the end of next year. So based on that agreement, we're planning to draw down from the 50,000 that are a transitional training and advising force right now down to zero at the end of 2011, at which point there won't be US troops in Iraq. Thank you. Let me ask you a, a question that probably pertains to after 2011. This is coming from DJ in Massachusetts. If Iraq descends into chaos and violence again, uh, what will be the US response? Well, what's happened uh, over the course of the last several years is that the incidences of violence in Iraq have continued to go down. Um, the levels of violence in 2009 were less than in 2008. The levels of violence in 2008 were less than in 2007. So there's been this steady trajectory to the point that now incidences of violence are at record lows uh, over the course of the last several months since the war began. That doesn't mean, though, that there's still not violence in Iraq. There is. Uh, we see occasionally uh, terrorist attacks uh, against the Iraqi people. However, we believe that the Iraqi security forces have demonstrated the capability to hold these security gains that have been made over the last months and years as they move into the lead. So we believe that there's not going to be a vacuum in terms of providing security because the over 600,000 Iraqi security forces who are there have that capability. Now, it's still important for work to be done in Iraq, both in terms of those security forces continuing to get better but also in terms of the Iraqis forming a government and resolving their outstanding political issues. We're confident that Iraq won't descend into chaos. Um, however, this 
transitional force that continues to advise and equip Iraqi security forces uh, is there to support uh, the Iraqi security forces and the Iraqi government. Again, to serve as a force that can buttress them, uh, that can continue to provide them with uh, logistics and intelligence and other kinds of training and equipping that can help them, again, hold these security gains. So we don't anticipate the scenario you, uh, you outline, but we also have built in to our, our strategy this buffer period of time, this transitional period of time, where our troops are there uh, to serve as support for the Iraqis as they continue to hold these security gains down. And again, that allows us to go on a counterterrorism mission if the Iraqis need our support. Uh, to target an al-Qaeda and Iraq leader, uh, we believe that uh, we have the force necessary to support them in that effort. Um, similarly, uh, we'll continue to strengthen our civilian engagement within Iraq, because what's so important now is that the Iraqis begin to, will continue to build their civilian institutions and continue to resolve their problems. And really the purpose of our strategy is to leave Iraq in a place where they can manage their own challenges and they can manage their own security. And we're confident, frankly, that they can do that. And that if there are outbreaks of violence, the Iraqi security forces can do that. And that's really what the president was talking about tonight, a transition from the United States having responsibility for security to Iraqis. Uh, and we're confident that we can uh, support them as they do so and sustain those gains, even as Iraq faces enduring challenges. Next question is coming from uh, SDWW in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he notes that President Bush indicated that the cost of this war would be paid by oil revenues from a liberated Iraq. How much has been received, and what are the plans to recover our costs? It's a, it's a good question, and uh, Portland is a, one of my favorite cities, I'll just say. I um, hope to get out there sometime uh, soon. But uh, it's a good question, and clearly uh, Iraq's oil revenues did not pay for the cost of the war. I think there were some... Um, overly optimistic scenarios that were put forward before the war. Um, the war has already cost American taxpayers um, well over uh, roughly three quarters of a trillion dollars. Um, so that's money that we spend in Iraq. And part of what uh, the president was saying tonight is that one of the reasons to wind down the war in Iraq is because we need to start reinvesting those resources here at home. Um, that there's a huge cost to fighting these wars. And we believe that ending the war is in Iraq's interest, because Iraq ultimately needs to be responsible, responsible for its own country and, and their own security. Um, but part of what we're trying to do is to draw down the amount of resources that we're committing to Iraq and focus, uh, again, those resources on other national security priorities and uh, on our economy here at home. Uh, as it relates to oil revenues, uh, that's part of this transition, is that we're uh, pressing the Iraqis, uh, again, to, to execute their own budgets, to pay, uh, pay their own way, um, to pay for their own basic services, and they've, been, they've begun to do that. Uh, and in fact, we've seen some of those oil revenues that you mentioned come online, and they serve as a primary source of revenue for the Iraqi government. So it won't recover the cost of, of the war, um, but it will uh, fund a lot of the efforts of the Iraqi government going forward. And that's, again, part of this transition, where the Iraqis are going to be picking up the bill um, for their own security, uh, for their own governance. We'll be there as a partner. Uh, we'll continue to be engaged in Iraq. We'll continue to support them. Uh, our experts, our civilian diplomats, will continue to advise Iraqi ministries about strengthening their capacity. Um, but based on those oil revenues and the Iraqi economy, um, we believe that the Iraqi government can now increasingly um, take full responsibility for, uh, again, uh, governing and securing their own country. Thank you. Uh, before I get to the next question, I'd just like to say, for anyone just joining now, we're taking uh, questions that you're giving to us. It's not too late. If you're online, go to youtube.com forward slash White House. Submit your question. We're picking from the most popular to ask Ben Rhodes right now. It's not too late. <laughs> uh, next question is about contractors. Uh, how many contractors providing either military or other services are remaining in Iraq, and who's supervising them and holding them accountable? And that came from RJ in Brooklyn. It's a, a, a Brooklyn. I'm from New York myself, RJ. So um, uh, I hope to. You know, <laughs> in better days, I lived in uh, I'd live in Park Slope. Uh, but um, the uh, what I would say is that uh, there are contractors uh, in Iraq. Um, they perform a variety of functions. Uh, these can include functions such as um, you know, providing security um, at certain facilities, um, like uh, our embassy, for instance. Um, some of those contractors you know, uh, provide, help uh, the Iraqi government as well. 
their contractors to perform functions uh, such as supporting uh, some of our ongoing uh, training efforts. What will happen uh, in Iraq going forward is uh, the State Department uh, will move into the lead with a lot of the functions that uh, the United States military carried out. Um, so part of what's happening today is, a, uh, as I said, a transition from U.S. to Iraqi responsibility for security. Um, but also what's taking place is a transition from the United States military being in the lead in Iraq to the United States uh, State Department being in the lead in Iraq and supervising certain functions such as uh, the training of Iraqi police, the building of Iraq's judicial capacity, um, and the oversight, as you, as you, as you asked, of uh, contractors in Iraq. Um, so our civilians in our State Department uh, will perform that function. Uh, I will also say that uh, we're aware of the, some of the excesses and outrages that uh, took place involving contractors in Iraq. And then Senator Obama was outspoken on this in the Senate, introduced some legislation to this effect. Uh, and what we've done is significantly strengthened our oversight of contractors. Um, again, so there's more accountability. Um, the Iraqis have an interest in this, of course, as well, that there's accountability within their judicial system for any actions that are taken by contractors. So what we've done is fostered far more responsible action uh, by those contractors uh, that remain in Iraq performing certain functions. Now a question uh, concerning our veterans. This is coming from Jan in Oklahoma. Uh, as a veteran myself, uh, what can our returning troops expect f from your administration in regards to health care and other VA benefits that we never received? Jen, well, first of all, thank you for your service. Um, I think tonight, uh, above all, what we wanted to do is use this milestone uh, with the end of our combat mission in Iraq and the completion of this drawdown of nearly 100,000 troops to reflect on uh, the services and sacrifice that's been rendered by Americans in Iraq. Um, and as you heard the president say tonight, uh, part of responsibly ending a war is caring for those who fought it, uh, and that there's really no higher obligation that we have as a nation than caring for our veterans. And what we've done since we came into office is make a truly historic commitment to our veterans to focus both on the veterans of these wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and also all of our veterans uh, who served in uniform. I'll point to a se several examples um, that are responsive to your question. First of all, we've taken steps to significantly increase care and services in support of the signature wounds of the Iraq War. Uh, you may be aware of the fact that post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury um, are afflicting a great number of our servicemen and women who served in Iraq. So the VA has ramped up, and, the D and DOD as well, uh, their ability to detect those injuries, to care for the, those who suffer from them, to build new uh, facilities that are uh, specialized around uh, these kinds of issues. So we want to really target um, uh, what we see to be these signature wounds of the wars. Uh, overall, as it relates to veterans' care and benefits, we're doing a number of things. Uh, we've made one of the largest increases in the VA budget in history. And part of that is geared towards ensuring that we have the resources available to pay for health care for veterans and to provide the benefits that veterans deserve. Also, we know that veterans have been frustrated in the past at the ability to get their benefits. There's a claims backlog. And what we're trying to do is clear that out uh, in large part by making, moving towards more digital uh, records um, so that the VA is running more efficiently and it is able to be more responsive to the needs of our veterans. So we have a commitment to provide our veterans with the health care and the benefits that they deserve. And then the last thing I'd say is, you heard the President say tonight, part of what we want our veterans to do is not just get the benefits and care that they deserve and get the treatment that they need uh, for the wounds of these wars, but that they have the opportunity to contribute to our country going forward. And that's why we're funding the post-9-11 GI Bill, which provides veterans and their families with the opportunities to get a college education. And we want to take steps to make sure that veterans get the, the education they need, the skills training they need, uh, and get to the front of the line in certain respects in terms of seeking employment so that veterans uh, can truly uh, take the lead in building our economy and building our country just as they have inspired us uh, in this war. So it's something that we're deeply committed to here and we'll constantly strive uh, to do better. And we have a really outstanding Secretary of the VA, and uh, General uh, Eric Shinseki, uh, who's deeply committed to this, a Vietnam veteran himself, um, who cares very deeply about our veterans. We've had a number of questions about oil fields. I've got a few specific ones from Florence in New Jersey. What is the status of the oil fields in Iraq? Who owns them? Who runs them? How much oil is the U.S. getting from Iraq? And specifically, Florence would like to know who's getting paid off of the oil fields in Iraq. What happens to the oil once we leave? 
Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, as you know, Iraq has one of the most, is one of the most oil-rich nations uh, in the world. Um, now, uh, to the earlier question, too, about uh, the Iraqi oil revenues, a lot of their infrastructure uh, around their oil fields and wells uh, was decimated, um, both by Saddam Hussein's mismanagement, by sanctions, and by years of war in Iraq. Um, so there was a serious uh, gap in terms of the oil production in Iraq uh, versus the, the, uh, the infrastructure that they needed. Um, a lot of that has begun uh, to be repaired uh, and to be brought back online. And Iraq is, again, on an upward trajectory in terms of the amount of oil that it's able to extract uh, from its oil fields. Uh, now, we, that, those resources are the property of the Iraqi people. Uh, and we've always made very clear the United States didn't go to Iraq to control it. We didn't go to Iraq to control their oil. Um, and so what we're focused on is making sure that the, Iraq, the revenue from uh, Iraq's oil fields uh, is the possession of the Iraqi people and is invested in the Iraqi people, uh, that it funds basic services through the government, uh, and that all Iraqis are able to prosper from those revenues. Um, because again, it is uh, a primary source uh, of, of funds for the Iraqi government and the Iraqi people. So that's been our focus, and we've continued to provide advice and support to the Iraqis as they've um, rebuilt that industry. Uh, of course, you know, it's up to the Iraqis um, to uh, do contracts with oil companies to come in and develop those fields, and they're actively doing that. Uh, but again, our basic fundamental principle is the, these revenues should be used to invest in the Iraqi people and their future. The Iraqi government shares that, that view as well, uh, and we'll continue to support them. And as those revenues come online, again, increasingly Iraqis are going to be able to fund their governance, their economy, uh, and their people going forward. Economically, Marsha from Portland is asking, how much will ending the Iraq war save in defense spending, and how will this impact other programs specifically? And a question just in from Laredo, Texas, from Sasquatch. How do you think ending this war will ultimately affect our economy? Um, well, uh, those are great questions. Um, the Iraq war, at the height of it, um, cost upwards of $100 billion a year. Uh, which is an extraordinary amount of money. I mean, if you think about the amount of money we spend on education and clean energy, uh, just to give you an example, I think we made the largest investment in clean energy, and I'd have to fact check this because uh, I'm not an energy expert, but I think we made the largest uh, investment in clean energy uh, in, in history in the United States through the stimulus bill, through the Recovery Act, and that was $80 billion. Um, and we were spending north of $100 billion in Iraq uh, throughout the course of the war. That number has come down dramatically, of course, as we brought our troops out of Iraq uh, and, and will continue to come down. Um, uh, so we're not spending anywhere near uh, the amounts of money that we were at the height of the war. Um, so therefore, uh, th that's just money that we're not going to be spending. Um, it's not taken away from certain defense systems because it was uh, more geared towards supporting the deployment of 150, 160,000 US troops in Iraq. A and what the president was talking about tonight is the necessity of taking that money, and this gets to the second question, and reinvesting in America, and reinvesting in our own economy. Um, because ultimately, the strength of our nation, the success of our people, is going to depend on the investments that we make at home. So uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, we saw a growth in deficits at a time in which we were uh, fighting these uh, two wars abroad. Um, and uh, also to give you a sense of that, we are spending um, you know, even less money in Afghanistan than we were at the height of the war in Iraq. Um, we have uh, slowly under 100,000 troops in Afghanistan, um, again, which is far less than we were deploying to Iraq at the height of uh, our operations there. So we brought that overall number down. We'll bring it down more as we uh, pivot to a transition in Afghanistan next year. Uh, and as the President said tonight, uh, our focus is going to be on making sure we're investing at home, bringing down our deficits, and ensuring the long-term competitiveness of our nation uh, and opportunity for our people. I think we've got time for one more question. So let's take Denise's from Seven Valleys, Pennsylvania. After seven years, thousands of American lives lost, thousands of Iraqi lives lost, what have we accomplished? Well, uh, it's, you know, it's a very appropriate question. Um, the, um, you know, we can all uh, debate uh, the history of the Iraq war. Uh, I think the president's position is well known. He opposed going to war um, in 2002 because he felt like it was a distraction from Al-Qaeda and some of our problems at home. Um, but we made uh, that decision and uh, we uh, 
engage in that war. I think what we, uh, irrespective of what we think about going to war, um, I think we can all agree that our troops rendered extraordinary service there. Uh, and through many ups and downs and through many challenges, they persevered. And what they were able to accomplish is what we are marking tonight, which is a transition to an Iraq that is able to stand on its own two feet, provide for its own security, provide for its own governance. Uh, the goal the president set uh, at his Camp Lejeune speech in February of 2009 uh, was an Iraq that is sovereign, stable, and self-reliant. Uh, and we believe that uh, we continue to make progress in achieving that goal. Um, so what we've achieved is uh, giving the Iraqi people a chance to determine their own destiny. Um, coming through uh, violent insurgency, sectarian warfare, terrorist attacks, uh, persevering through all of those um, challenges in Iraq, and coming out on the other end in a place where uh, you know, we can't solve every problem in Iraq. We can't stay in Iraq forever until uh, any kind of uh, violence has been uh, rooted out. But we can leave Iraq in a place where the Iraqi people have an opportunity, a good opportunity, uh, to secure their own country and to provide for their own people. Um, so that's what we've achieved. Um, and uh, again, I think what we can all agree on, even if we have disagreements about uh, the decision to go to war, uh, is that our, our troops and civilians, too, in Iraq have, have, have rendered extraordinary service in, in doing that. And I'll just say, since it's uh, the end, it's um, the, uh, the decision tonight is very important to the president because, you know, this was a fundamental commitment of his in the Senate as a candidate for president, uh, that to end the war in Iraq, we needed to transition our troops out and leave uh, the Iraqis in charge of their own affairs, in charge of their own security, and that that was necessary for Iraq, because if Iraq was going to solve its problems uh, and truly move forward as a sovereign nation, they needed to move into the lead for uh, respons responsibility for securing their country. And that's what we've done. And we also, though, uh, felt like it was essential to end the Iraq war to address some of these other challenges, some of which we've talked about tonight, uh, whether it's redeploying some of those resources so that we're more focused on al-Qaeda, which poses the most direct threat to the United States, um, or reinvesting some of those resources over time in our own economy. Um, because, frankly, the strength of our nation, both our national security and the prosperity of our people, is going to depend on that long-term competitiveness, whether people can get a good education, whether we're leading the world in clean energy, whether we're creating the kind of economy that can create jobs for our people uh, and truly lead the world again. Uh, so that's what we're focused on, uh, and I feel like that's the progress that's been made uh, tonight. It's a milestone. It's not the end of the road uh, in terms of uh, our support for Iraq. Um, but it's an important opportunity to reflect on, again, what we've been able to do, what our troops have been able to do, and the opportunities that exist for our nation going forward as we wind down this war. Well, thank you. I'd, I'd just like to wrap up with a few thank yous. First, obviously, to Ben Rhodes for taking the time to be with us tonight. Uh, also to Google Moderator and YouTube, who made it possible for us to do the program today. Um, I want to thank you for submitting your questions and for watching the program. And if you have a few moments, uh, I'd like to encourage you to take a moment to thank the troops for their service in Iraq. You can go to whitehouse.gov salute forward slash salute to learn a little bit more about how you can participate and thank the troops. Uh, and then a little service announcement. If you missed any of the president's address or any of this Q&A, we'll have it online uh, tomorrow on whitehouse.gov. Take a look. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good night, and we look forward uh, to continuing the dialogue. Bye. Thank you.